patients as we um, as we embark on this technological phase of all of our lives together. So thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Karen to introduce you and to start this third of our webinar series for the month for Alzheimer's Awareness Month. So just a note to everybody, we record these oh, sessions. Right. So if you'd like to put your cameras off, please do. And if you can please um, keep yourself um, muted. When it comes time to ask questions, please choose the chat function, which is at the bottom of the screen. Otherwise, please use the raise hand functions. Um, thank you again for Professor Patashnik for taking the time to join us. And I'll hand over to Karen to make introductions. Well, hi, everybody. Um, good morning. I'm just going to um, put my screen um, back on here. Hold on two minutes. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have Professor Patoshnik um, join us on this webinar and um, and particularly because today is his birthday. So that's, uh, that's quite spectacular. Thank you for spending part of your birthday with all of us and we wish you um, good health, happiness and abundance always. Um, and also just to know that you're appreciated beyond measure for all that you do for those that um, those families that struggle um, and for the challenges that um, that people with dementia themselves uh, face. So after obtaining his medical degree at Wits University in 1975, um, Felix went in a till for five years where he obtained his diploma in mid midwifery um, in 1978. Um, he came down to Cape Town um, where he obtained his psychiatric qualification at uh, UCT in 1984 and he started his career heading their psychogeriatric unit and continued in this position where he came across to the University of Stellenbosch in 1994. He is the former head of the psychogeriatric unit of Tigerberg and Stickland hospitals and might I just add that this is the only, these are the only, uh, um, this is the only psychogeriatric unit um, in the country. Um, so, um, and he represents old age psychiatry for the provincial government of the Western Cape and the South African Society of Psychiatrists, SASOP. Um, his research interests include clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, zinc, vitamins A and D, and the burden of disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, and equine nutrition. Um, he also runs a private practice in Durbanville in Cape Town. So very, very, very warm welcome, Professor Potoshnik. And um, if I can just maybe add that um, my wonderful journey um, with, with my mother um, started actually at, um, with Professor Potoshnik's uh, um, clinic at uh, Tigerberg and Sticklant Hospital, where my mother was actually one of the, um, the clinical trial candidates for the drug which is now called Aricept. And I think that um, just in terms of the benefits of, of um, engaging in um, some of the clinical trial and, and research work which, which is being done, I'd actually just like to pose to Professor Patoshnik, um, you know, there are obviously very stringent requirements um, in becoming a candidate for clinical trials. Um, and if people are interested in, you know, any of those requirements, etc., cetera, um, can we ask people to contact us and we'll pass them on to yourselves? Because I think that if I look back and see the amount of um, support, enormous support that we actually got being part of a, of a clinical trial, um, you know, it, it was absolutely unbelievable. So can you just walk us through um, or talk us through just some of the, the, the things that are required in terms of a clinical trial. How does a clinical trial really work then? Hi, Karen. Uh, I trust you can hear me and thank you very much for your warm welcome. Um, clinical trials are a necessity because um, so only the companies can work out whether their medication works or doesn't. So. Um, half the number are usually uh, of subjects on the, on the real product and the others are on a placebo. Uh, they're called double blinds in that we don't know, uh, the company doesn't even know. There's a small subgroup in America called the Data Monitoring Committee and they know who gets what. 
So after initial short period, everyone goes on to the real product. Uh, that's what we call the reward period. And with that, they can work out whether it's actually working or not and what the side effect profile is. So it's very safe. Uh, they monitor all the time. And should they feel that there are more adverse events in the one group than the other, they will stop the trial immediately if these are pose a danger. So yes, that's where we are. We've got four medications on the market to date. Uh, three in one group, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and as you said, the Aricept or Donepazole is the market leader there. And in the other one, it was a Bixa, uh, Mamantine, which also has several generics now. And uh, you need both, ideally, in order to get the best benefits of both. So. I cannot hear you. Um, Shanae? There we go. No, 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 no. no. It's, me. Oh. It's, it's me. Okay, there we okay. go. Um, yeah, sorry okay. about that. Yeah, sorry. I just sorry, wanted to you. know then in terms of the, um, in terms of recruiting for, for clinical trials, obviously there is a start period and an end period. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. So we, we have a screening period first to see that everything uh, checks out. Um, People don't usually fail a screened uh, test unless we pick up something in the heart or something the laboratory shows which one can't see as, as such. So that's already the initial benefit. We've had to refer a few people to the cardiologist who didn't realize how dicky the ticker was. And uh, some had abnormal lab results which needed attention. So once those are sorted, um, they then carry on with the procedure. And then if they fit the criteria, um, depending on what the trial demands, they're usually for Alzheimer's disease, but we have one or two that are for other forms of dementia as well. Uh, we can then initiate the treatment and uh, put them on the trial. And then there's regular monitoring. They get physicals, they do ECGs, they do blood tests questionnaires and tests and uh, it's all free in fact you get paid for each visit it's a mandate from uh, the the, uh, the medical council and um, uh, so most people sort of I have a little get together now from a distance across the room um, because we try and get the, the couples to come together on the same day so that they see each other and um, yeah it's fun they, they enjoy it where they usually at the end of a trial there's a brief washout period and they promptly enlist again for another trial so uh, recently there was a show um, on tv Prontate, Gesundheit, yeah. and the one person there i think had been on eight trials all these years um, he for those listeners who were watching is one of those who has benefited to such an effect. He almost seems to have stayed up there, as, as, a, as the partner said. Uh, I was shocked, she said, that uh, he hadn't deteriorated. We were actually delighted he hadn't deteriorated. So somehow these things have all uh, left an indelible mark and kept him functioning at a very high level. Right, I, I actually did watch that program, and I was quite, I was, I was uh, quite heartened by it because I know all those years ago, um, way back in about 1992, 93, 94, when my mother became first became part of the trial, I was absolutely astonished at how much medical intervention there actually is besides just the trial part of it um how much was actually available um as you say for free so for those that are struggling um on medical aids etc not paying or are very uh, you know have had to downgrade their medical aids um you know or are part of a state system um it certainly is something to consider because the the, the attention that you get from for general um, health is absolutely um, is absolutely amazing. So um, I'd like to just move on then and just uh, um, state one glaring uh, um, statistic that we have in South Africa way, way back when I started out in um, dementia and, and Alzheimer's. Um, there were, uh, I think, 10 
um, geriatricians at the time, of which about five or six of them were based in the Western Cape. Um, and it seems as though the Western Cape has been, um, been quite a consistent contender for it. Um, I don't know whether it's the mountain or the conditions here, but anyway, we now in South Africa have four geriatric psychiatrists serving a population of well over 6 million elderly. Um, and we have some 20, uh, 20 uh, uh, geriatricians also dealing with a, um, an elderly profile of well over, six, uh, well over six million elderly in the country. It's an enormous burden. Um, in your opinion, you know, what, what is the way in which people who are taking care of people with dementia, um, Professor Potoshnik, uh, can access a, um, a better state of longevity with dementia um, than those that, um, that don't have the disease? Right, we, we're talking the preventative measures now before the onset of a dementia. Yes. Well, firstly, if, if you're a, a woman and you reach the a menopause and uh, you should have your bloods tested because if there is a hormone deficiency, uh, a, a simple measure of giving treatment for some two to five years already diminishes the risk of women um, a high incidence of Alzheimer's in later years. Um, as you know, currently uh, females have more Alzheimer's disease than men, but that effect is negated uh, once women actually get treatment around menopause with hormone replacement therapy. So for those who need it, it's definitely indicated. Um, another measure is uh, living well um, or fit or uh, healthily, I should say. And here the spin-offs being that um, due to the strong drive towards cardiovascular health, um, the vessels, the state of the vessels has improved. And um, it's vascular disease that precipitates Alzheimer's disease. In other words, uh, you can die with Alzheimer's disease in the brain, but not show any senility or any symptoms in about 40% of cases, if you have no additional vascular disease. But if you now have a small, small stroke, then already it's only 25% of cases. And if you have more widespread vascular disease on the brain, then there's a 100% chance that you will show senility at the time of death. So in other words, if you can keep your vascular system under control, you can help stop uh, precipitating the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So um, this cardiovascular risk factor also drops the overall incidence of Alzheimer's disease. So in, in the Western world now, um, the, the incidence is actually dropping significantly. They, they can show it statistically um, what we call significance is now the statistical term, not significant in that, wow, you know, they don't have Alzheimer's anymore. No, they're swamped with it. There's a problem. But it is diminishing because we've got the cardiovascular factors under control. Now, the cardiovascular risk factors are high blood pressure, um, the diabetes, it's the cholesterol, uh, it's uh, exercising, keeping weight down, um, not smoking and uh, alcohol and caffeine in moderation and cocoa. And these last three, the alcohol, uh, the limit that actually also helps you is red wine, 250 to 500 milliliters a day. It's quite generous, a third to half a bottle of red wine Absolutely. a day. Yeah, most people like that. They don't argue. Um, coffee, uh, it's been established healthier than um, green tea, oddly enough, and healthier than the so-called English black tea, but no comparisons yet with rooibos. So uh, coffee would be three to five cups of filter coffee a day. Um, if you decaf the coffee, it loses that effect, and if you use instant coffee, unfortunately, it loses that effect. So, but you can stick to your bodum, your Nespresso, and that'll do fine. Um, the cocoa equivalent that's good for you is the same as some 40 grams of a uh, chocolate bar that uh, is 70 to 80% cocoa by content. 
So that amount of cocoa a day is also beneficial. And then there are a few others on the vitamins. We know that um, the vitamin B group uh, helps the vascular system, especially in the brain and homocysteine levels. Uh, we know that people did better with vitamin E, uh, but that would be 300 units or less per day, not more. And vitamin C, 300 milligrams per day, um, can have less, but not more than 300 milligrams. So there's quite a, an emphasis on not going too high. Uh, vitamin D, is roughly a uh, thousand international units a day between 800 and a thousand and then supplementing with calcium and then those who who are arthritic who are on voltal norbrufen they appear to have an added effect um, a, a protective effect because these drugs are anti-inflammatories and alzheimer's and all these illnesses are actually inflammation of the brain so they already have a kind of a built-in anti-inflammatory. The, um, then the others is to keep yourself intellectually stimulated. Uh, we don't personally believe in a new language, all right? Because remember, most of these illnesses affect the cortex first. And the way it works with a language is your primary language or your mother tongue gets embedded in the white matter and subsequent languages are in the cortex. That is why, as you demand, you actually lose your secondary languages first and then end up with your primary language. So, so now to go and flog the horse and say, learn a language, learn a language, makes no sense whatsoever. What you do do is that you, by association, by uh, caregiving, by emotional stimulus, you share and you you chat and you keep it alive, you keep those circuits going, you dig up old albums, you go into weddings. Um, one of the strongest protective factors is actually having a confidant lifelong. And we know this from the Nigerian studies that those who had a confidant were protected against Alzheimer's disease. And this is something we overlook because we're so busy and we don't take the time to phone or make contact, but you need a very, very close confidant to keep you going and straight and narrow. Um, Professor Patoshnik, you mentioned Nigeria, and I know that the work of Professor Raj Kalario has been, um, you know, is, is very well known and it's been quite significant. Um, what are the, are there any current relations in terms of the group of or the population group most uh, um, uh, susceptible to um, developing a dementia? What do those studies show? Yes, um, why they studied Nigeria is because um, that was the source of most of the black Americans now through the slave trade. So now you had, as it were, genetic samples still back in uh, Nigeria and you had the same genetic sample in the Americas. And uh, the issue was, is Alzheimer's the same in both? Well, it wasn't in the early 90s. Nigeria had a considerably lower rate of Alzheimer's disease, whereas the black American was very close to their white counterparts. What's interesting is that since then, and the Nigerian counterpart has picked up quite rapidly. Um, still not there, same as with our South African black population. They haven't quite caught up uh, with the other ethnic groups. So there is something about westernization that does that, that helps precipitate through vascular disease, Alzheimer's disease. It also means that you live longer. Remember, if you had uncontrolled vascular disease, you'd die of a stroke at 50 or 60. So you would never live long enough to get Alzheimer's disease in the first place. But now that you're, you're on a better health system, you unfortunately live long enough to develop Alzheimer's disease. But if you now have those vascular factors under control, there's a decline overall in dementia and in Alzheimer's disease especially. So what we found in the American black is that they now have less Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia than they had before. 
as is uh, but for the counterparts, the white counterparts, because of the control of the cardiovascular risk factors. That's very, very interesting. Um, and just if we look at today, um, you know, 2020, um, can you just give us a brief update on where we are in research um, and some of the things which have been stopped, which were previously hailed as possibly being, um, you know, the silver bullet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Where are we today in terms of, of um, you know, finding some kind of, of breakthrough? Right. Um, we, we haven't been as, fort as fortunate or as uh, doing as well as, say, for cancer treatment. Um, Alzheimer's is a particularly difficult nut to crack. Having said that, there have been huge advances since the 1990s. We understand the disease much better. We know how to chip it away. We know how to delay it. We know how to pick it up much earlier. And that is the primary focus now, that as a person reaches the age of 60, and he has some memory problem. Our personal belief is you jump and you start treatment. So um, this might come as a shocker because people say, oh, you're talking supplementation. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. For those who need it, where it's indicated supplement. The same way as you would supplement if you had a hormone deficiency. The same way as you would supplement with calcium and vitamin D3 if you had a vitamin D deficiency. So really, you, you buy those extra time, and yes, you may, putting it crudely, die of something else, but it may not be Alzheimer's disease, and you'll have a fuller life. So um, those are the benefits we've made. We would like more medications on the market, and we had some very close ones, uh, meaning they were close to being marketed, who then unfortunately got pulled at the very end. And we had some of these studies which, we, which have been running for years, uh, especially in the monoclonal antibodies, which showed huge promise. And some just simply didn't make it statistically at the end of the day and had to be pulled from the market. So um, we've investigated some 75 compounds. We know that sooner or later we will catch that silver bullet or a good chunk of it. And meanwhile, the issue is to do the best you can and uh, keep your options open, um, stay active, get involved, uh, do something towards this problem. Um, Britain's working on one in three of the population dying of dementia. Now, that is massive in what's required. And I'm, I'm not talking doctors now. I'm talking NGOs, um, healthcare workers, allied professionals. It is a massive problem. Um, what we do on our medical side, we're obviously trying to get as many general practitioners and others involved as possible in order to... We started at 12, love. Right. So, um, yes, that's, that's more or less where we are. It's an ongoing thing. And we're involving as many disciplines as possible. We join them at all times and we try and support each other to get uh, the better of this uh, problem. Wow, thank you for that. Sure. It, it is, you know, you mentioned, um, you mentioned cancer and, and that. And I, I always, you know, look at the amount of money that is invested in cancer research um, versus that which goes into dementia research. And I think that, uh, you know, when one looks at the, at the, 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 the numbers of people affected, um, obviously we do also see that, uh, um, you know, the numbers in, in cancer, of, of cancer patients is increasing. Um, but the amount of people that are actually living with dementia is as frightening and possibly even double those with cancer. But the amount of, of, of money that is invested in, in the, the disease um, still needs uh, some kind of, of, um, of uh, review. Um, yes, Karen, I... you're absolutely correct there. Um, if I may interrupt and explain that further from our side. The, the issue is that um, there are better returns, say, on, on investing in a cancer drug or other illnesses 
because Alzheimer's has, has become such a tough nut to crack and shareholders want their return. So to put a stop to that, Obama now uh, laid down a law that a certain amount of money had to go towards Alzheimer's disease because ultimately the state ends up with all these patients with Alzheimer's disease to care for. So it doesn't help that you eradicate all the other illnesses at the expense of the major one that, as you point out, is, is in, encroaching more and more on the lives of everybody. Yeah, quite right. Yeah, and I, I do, thank you. I do uh, also recall um, some uh, research which was, uh, which was done in uh, Australia by uh, Professor um, in Sydney, what is his name? Such a lovely man. Um, oh, I, can't, I can't get to his name, Henry Brodati, um, where he speaks about, you know, besides the fact that it's the person living with dementia, there are up to five to six people within a family unit that are affected by a person, um, you know, the disease or the diagnosis of dementia. And I think that, you know, that is quite significant too, when one sees you know, what other uh, um, disease profiles there can be within, within a family, besides the other mental health uh, risks that there are, um, there also is the need for, uh, for some, kind of, uh, some kind of care. And, and that's, I think, where, you know, Dementia SA is uh, really wanting to make, and is, I believe, making a difference in terms of being able to support people living with dementia, as well as the families that care for them. Um, if we look at that in terms of what is available on the essential drug list at our state hospitals, um, are any of these medications available on, on the EDL? No, they're not. Uh, not a single one. And even the best of medical aids um, usually refuse to pay. So even if you are on a medical aid, um, chances are they will not pay for it. They don't recognize it as a PMB and they won't offer any payment towards it. Um, we have been fighting. It's uh, possibly something now. which, um, you know, yes. yeah, I think that uh, we should possibly do something like that, you know, that uh, yes. we, we launch some kind of uh, uh, um, uh, sort of protest, if one can call it that. I mean, because these kinds of things really need action. Um, you know, what we've also had and we've also heard from many people out in the, um, in the, the government hospital uh, uh, service providers is that sometimes the psychiatric facilities are not able to actually um, diagnose effectively. So the awareness um, and the actual screening for people living with dementia out in some of these clinics and, and, and hospitals is really, really tragic and quite sad. Well, yes, we, we hope we have made a difference there. Um, it's now standard teaching in the university medical schools and uh, as well for nurses as for doctors and physios and occupational therapists. They all have lectures on dementias. They all have lectures on the new, other neurodegenerative disorders um, that occur well in, uh, before in youth. And um, they have lectures on delirium and especially lectures on the elderly, uh, which was almost unknown 30 years ago. So there have been great strides by sheer numbers and by interest. We have uh, fortunately a lot of young people now showing an interest in elderly and the science of elderly, whereas previously we got the middle aged to retiree showing an interest which uh, was often short-lived there. Um, so um, people are investing now. They are doing a lot more about it. And there's a genuine care. And I think mostly there's an awareness. Now, I know there'll be a big awareness again when next we have voting, because suddenly the elderly are right in the forefront. But they're usually left behind quite soon after that. So, um, But suddenly people are aware that there are a lot of elderly but we'd like to keep it in people's minds at all times, as you say, so that Absolutely. it's an ongoing process, especially with regards to med medication. Right, so just on the topic of medication, there has been a medical or a medication question, um, and it reads as follows. My mother has Alzheimer's and is currently taking Donocept. At a talk 
last year, a professor mentioned that there has been a good result from using Donocept in conjunction with Memantine. When I mentioned this to my mom's neurologist, he was quite non-committal, and as yet we haven't added Memantine to her regime. What does professor recommend, and if the medical aid will only pay for one drug, which is pref uh, preferable? Right. Um, firstly, the originated drugs, as it were, are, are fairly expensive. They're available, but very expensive. And the generics work very well. The generics come in at about 40% of the originated drugs price. And uh, we haven't detected any problems with them. In other words, they work as well and as good as the originated. Now, if you're on both medications, you definitely have an advantage over being only on one of them. So when I say both, uh, there are three in one group. That is your denepazil, your uh, rivastigmine, and then your galantamine. And in the uh, standing, uh, standalone is then your mamanti. So you're actually limited to two medications because the three are in the same grouping. And the idea is that you take one of those. People normally run with a donepazil. It's also the most affordable of all of them, all four of them. It clocks in at the moment, depending on where you are in the dimension, whether you only need it for mild cognitive impairment, it clocks in at around 240 rands for the month, if that. But you might only need half the dose, so really it makes a difference. So you might bulk buy and cut it and, and then use half this month, half next month. And then once you're stable on that and you've seen the benefits, you're also more inclined to go on to something like Memanti. And uh, you can also start with Memanti and go the other way. The question with the medical aid, I've in part therefore answered, Memanti is more expensive. Um, uh, the two times 10 milligram will come in at three... 60 rand now. I stand under correction because prices change all the time. But for, for quite a length of time, we were able to treat on both medications full dose at just under 500 rand. I believe that's no longer possible. It's come up to about 550 rand or more. So it's, it is hard, but it is kind of within reach for more people than it used to be. And unfortunately, then the originated product allowed. Now, but having said that, if you have a side effect on the nepazol, then you're forced to use one of its companions and now it becomes expensive. So uh, although still not quite the price of an originator medication, you would be paying more than you're paying for the memanti. So if you're not tolerating the donepazol, then you want the other medication, your, um, uh, your galantamine, to be the one that the medical aid pays for. But by and large, you want the memantine to be the one that the medical aid pays for. It's more expensive. If you can follow that. She, she, the lady said she's on donepazole for a year, so we assume there'd be no side effects. So if she had a choice, medical aid should pay for the memantine if they were to pay for one of the medications. Right, okay. And that, I think, will end up in a fight with the medical aid. Um, yes. But that's, that's, that's a fight and a discussion for another day. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And a long, drawn-out battle. Absolutely, absolutely. Professor Potoshnik, there's been a question um, about um, the... Um, how bad can dementia get and what foods are bad for dementia? Sure. Um, all those preventative factors tend not to work anymore once you start to dement. All right. So your Mediterranean diet's very good for you. Your vegetarian diet's very good for you. And they all help stem the tide towards dementia. But once dementia kicks in, unfortunately, there's very little you can do to budget off course. You can delay it with the cognitive enhancers that we mentioned. And that is why we advocate their use, because they take off the stress from your caregiver. So they're very, very necessary. But to then say, oh, I'm giving my husband omega-3 and I'm giving him that and giving him that, 
it makes very little it, it's very little effect and what what sort of um worries one is people bringing big brown bags full of supplements and then telling you oh we can't afford the Aricept or the bixa which in fact they then could afford if if they put their money in the right place so the idea is about all means do all the preventative measures but once you have it um get going on the medication um it'll help you it'll alleviate the stress and it doesn't lengthen the life of the person but he's higher functioning which means he's he or she are easier to look after it slows down the disease without doubt and it's cost beneficial they've worked out that using the figures for the originator product you get eight times back by using a medication timelessly in the beginning eight times in financial gain so even financially it makes a lot of sense using it cause the uh, care home is such an expensive thing eventually in your third stage where you need care with caregivers because you as a caregiver often can't turn your partner anymore and clean properly and attend to all their needs and the nursing care it becomes very expensive so to delay the onset of that stage, you need the medication and makes it worthwhile. Right, Professor Patoshan, just one last um, uh, question, which uh, I've just seen now is, what is the difference between mild cognitive impairment, MCI, and actually dementia? Right, mild cognitive impairment is sort of the twilight zone between uh, being normal and having uh, an early dementia. So in other words, you have similar deficits, but they impact rather uh, periodically on your daily life without disrupting it totally or fully. So, um, the, you know, it's normal, say, to go into a room and then say, ah, oh, what was I here for? And then leave again, and then it hits you why you went there in the first place. But were you to do that four or five times a day now, it impacts on your social life or on your work life. So your MCI, your mild cognitive impairment, might do that twice that day, not as often. So he still gets by, but he's considerably slowed down. He needs much more efforts. He'll need a list for virtually everything. But he won't, unlike your dementia, now forget to read the list. All right, he'll, he'll follow the list. He'll get into a store and he'll probably come around with all the correct items. But it's harder for him to get there. And to make life easier, he may earlier than a dementia patient uh, scale down uh, to a smaller living quarters, more manageable setup with less obligations and responsibilities. So that's your MCI, it's a twilight state. And we're saying start treatment there. The minute you see things are a little beyond what you would call normal aging, start treatment. Wow, fantastic. Thank you for that. I'm going to hand over to Abigail, who's going to uh, just uh, um, work with opening up the floor to everybody and, and how we're going to do that, how that's going to be facilitated. Thanks, Thanks Abigail. Thanks, Corinne, and thank you so much, Professor. That was incredibly, incredibly interesting. Um, and I, I took so much away from, from everything that you, that you said. Um, we're going to open up the floor now for anybody who has questions. Um, if you want to, please use the raise hand function. So that can be found if you click at the bottom of the screen on participants. Um, you are able to raise your hand through that function and I, I can call on you. Um, if you could keep your, uh, your questions, um, maybe ask one at a time and if we have a chance to come back to you, then we can circle back. Okay, love more. Nice to see you again, love more. Um, I will unmute you and please ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, love more. Go right ahead. Um, what happens if the person he doesn't take any medication, but he could have dementia?
love more is that hello is that, is that um is that the beginning part is there more to your question yeah what happen if the person it doesn't take any medication and okay. two uh, and i need to know if the person like prato is it a the medication to give somebody who could a dementia prato Okay, so what would happen to somebody if they didn't receive any medication? What would their experience of dementia be like without the medication? Is that right? Yes. Perfect. And, and right. then particular medication, I'll hand over to Professor. Yes. Um, the, the course of the illness is that it goes very slow in the beginning, then very fast, and then in your final care stage, very slow again. So you have what we call a sinusoidal deterioration it's not a straight line. So if you're on medication, you slow down the illness. You cannot cure it, but you slow it down. So it goes slowly, 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 and right to the end fast. So it's more like a waterfall or a gentle or a cascade, quite a sharp cascade. Um, so, that, so that's the essential difference between the two. We're not talking that the one lives less long or the other way we're not going to that's very complex but you get a more higher functioning person with those who have medication that is why it's so important to get medication Love more if i answered that for you um professor sorry i just had a scratch in my throat and then yes I think yes, yes okay thank and uh, love more than the second part of your question you asked specifically around a particular medication. Yeah, I was asking about Pulato. Uh, so people maybe they give Pulato to come down for the patient of the dementia. Um, love more, could you spell that for me, please? I, I'm struggling to work out what it is. Oh, oh, okay, I can just hold out oh, two minutes. Okay, um, love more. While, while you do that, Professor, we've had um, a question come in. You had mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that if people were interested in possibly joining trials, they could contact you. How, how should they go about doing that? Hello? Right in, in the Cape, um, either through Karen Dementia SA, or uh, they can phone us direct. We're at 021-946-3347. Now, the way it works is that there are always several sites involved in research. So almost invariably, there'll be a site in Johannesburg, often one in Durban, and often one in the Eastern Cape, normally Port Elizabeth. So that helps you. We can then redirect you to the other groups involved. The way research works is that the initial phases might be done in one of the key countries, but they then always go global to, to get a feel for how the medication works worldwide. So in South Africa, when it becomes global with us, as well, it's Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban, and Port Elizabeth, and sometimes the Free State, Bloemfontein. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, Lavmo, I will unmute you again. Sorry, you've got those details now. Yeah, I was the spelling is P P U R A T A. Yeah, that's um, it's not a, a memory enhancer. Um, you're you're talking medication now that calms people. Um, those are a, a different setup. So they won't actually affect the, the memory as such or the behavior in that way or, or the ability to function. What it does, it calms them so that they're not as uh, restless or as active or, um, as they would have been without it. Terrific. Thank you, Professor. Oh. Uh, Lavro, okay, are, you, are you satisfied with those answers? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you Thank so you. much. Lovely to see you. Um, okay, Professor Chris, you're up next. I'm gonna. You are unmuted. Terrific. You can ask your question. That's me. 
Uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'm new to all this computer business. I, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. Welcome. Um, We're very happy to have you here. You're doing very well. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the professor, my husband got Louis's body dementia and Parkinson's and he's suddenly taken a very bad downward turn so much so we can't even do any exercises. So now the problem is that we can't turn him over in bed. He's on seven medications in the morning and seven at night, which I think is far too much. But is there anything we can do to help him get some sort of movement back again? Um, it's a very tricky one, and uh, it is more in the area of the physiotherapist and the neurologist yeah. who have specific yeah. agents for cramps and uh, those myoclonic jerks and things that you experience. They generally, yeah. uh, the person does need less medication, so you can certainly review it uh, yeah. because it sounds as if it's more in the third stage of the illness. Where yes, I think so and involvement of uh, helpers is, is a far more benefit than any exact right. medical okay. intervention. You know. um, the, the other thing, Professor, I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's as well, which is, came as mm -hmm. quite a shock, and I've got a tremor, a resting tremor. Um, I'm just on one medication, which seems to be doing the trick. Um, but I'm, I'm a little looking ahead. I'm frightened. Am I going to get as bad as he is or with just Parkinson's without the other part of it do you always get dementia with Parkinson's no you don't um no, your okay. your if your general rate is some 10 percent it might be slightly high with Parkinson's but yeah not something that would raise a flag and alter your lifestyle okay and, um, I in your position would work very closely with the neurologist who is looking after you. Yeah. Uh, by and large, in South Africa, psychiatrists don't interfere with Parkinson's. They feel their colleagues are better equipped to deal with it. And um, there's some physicians who are very good at Parkinson's as well. But um, mm. psychiatrists have more than enough other work to do. So we, we wouldn't interfere. We would augment and help, but we would yep. say work very closely with your neurologist on this one. Okay, thank yeah, you. And, and um, yeah, keep your hopes up. They, they almost more strides in Parkinson's and dementia than in Alzheimer's, I'd say. Really many mm. more. Good. Uh, so, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Your best wishes. Yes. Thanks, Chris. Lovely to have you. We hope to see you again. Um, I'm sure you will. Excellent. And just before I call on George, I see George's hand is up, which possibly will be the last question of the day. Um, just a reminder to everybody that we run a virtual support group on Thursdays at 1 p.m. And we send out that link via our WhatsApp support group as well as email. If you're not on that WhatsApp support group or don't receive that email, please feel free to chat me in this, um, on this Zoom chat. Otherwise, email me at projects at dementiasa.org um, and I'd be happy to add you. So that's 1 p.m. this Thursday and that's every Thursday. Um, also next week, Tuesday at 12 p.m., we have Dr. Julie Eklin joining us. And my last point of admin before I hand over to, to George for his question is that I've posted a survey in the chat um, function of this call, which if you could all please take five minutes to fill in, we would greatly appreciate it. Dementia SA are kind of exploring a whole new world of possibility in terms of how we function and help and make the most of what we do. And part of that is looking at our monitoring and evaluation and how we can best report a theory of change to those who come to us and those who fund us. So if you could take five minutes to do that, um, okay, George, I'm going to unmute you and it's your turn to ask a question. Thank you. Um, I good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for, for sharing this amazing uh, way of living that we are doing it at the moment. It's not actually a question. I was at the uh, dementia support group one day and there was a journalist uh, in, in the meeting. I don't think he was suffering from any dementia or whatever, 
but he was sitting there with a book. And then nearly at the end of the meeting, he, he made a statement and he said that if the governments of the countries doesn't do anything urgently about this dementia and Alzheimer's, then our countries will be a country full of zombies. And I thought that was, uh, for me, I thought that man was stupid. But as I listened to you today, I kind of starting to believe that if we don't get what we were talking about, then this could very well happen. So thank you very much for putting my mind kind of at ease. Thanks very much. Abigail, you wish to weigh in, yes. Right. Sorry, Karen, sorry. No, 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 carry on. Go, go, go ahead, Abigail. No, I was just, I, uh, thank you. Thank you, George, for, for adding that. Um, I, I think we, we possibly have time for one more question, if anybody, if anybody would like to, to ask. Otherwise, um, just a huge, 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 huge thank you, um, Professor Potashnik. As I said, I'd, I'd, I've heard so much about you and um, your, just your grace and your wisdom and everything, really. It, it's, it's palpable even through, even through a, uh, a screen that just says Felix on it. It really is. You know, thank, you. thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, and I know that it means so much to everybody here. Um, Neil... Do you want to ask a question? We've got time for one more. Yeah, please, thanks. Uh, just the prof, um, you spoke about the sinusoidal wave or the condition or the deterioration. My wife's got FTD and she's almost 18 months, three years since she was diagnosed. She's on uh, Donacep and um, Memo. And I just want to know if it's the right medication and does what you said about the sinusoidal wave also apply to the FTD? Right. The, our problem is that for a definitive diagnosis, while the person is live, uh, we, we need very specific neuroimaging, and South Africa hasn't got that capability. The other way is to go via lumbar puncture and do the cerebrospinal fluid analysis. And at the moment, we also haven't got, got that. So when we do our research studies, those samples where they indicate it actually get sent to Switzerland, Sweden, or America, who then do an analysis. So that's the only way we know whether one really has the correct diagnosis or not. Where hope lies on the horizon for South Africa is that um, they correlate the cerebrospinal fluid with blood tests. And that is why you'll have heard that we might have a blood test for Alzheimer's any day soon. And that's that correlation. So we'll have skipped that whole era and gone straight over to a blood test for Alzheimer's disease. And we'll all say, wow, where did that come from? That's where it's come from. Um, so um, what exactly your wife has is a clinical diagnosis. If she responds on um, the donocept and on the memantine, then I, I'd say you continue with it. You know, if she's done well. There will come a stage, unfortunately, towards the end where she will no longer respond. And at that point, you wean her off over three to six months uh, because the medication doesn't work all the way. It, it, uh, it works while there is a substrate of, of nerves or nervous system that can make a change. But at some point, it, it battles to do that. Okay. Thank you. If that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. If they do a mini mental test, it's around 8 out of 30. So uh, below 8 or below, it tends no longer to be as effective. If I can give you that as a guide. Okay, thanks. In other words, full nursing care. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thanks. You're welcome, yeah. Thank you so much again, Professor. Um, we really are. Yeah, just thank you. I don't know, Karen, if you want to, before we kind of close off, just with one or two admin details, if you want to 
say anything. Yes, um, I'll keep it very brief. You know, the the Mormons uh, appear to live the healthiest the longest. And the key factor that stands out is good sleep. And um, there's more and more research to show that if we get to sleep, at least, yeah, I know people are twinkling now about the sleep. I mean, sleeping on your own now, you know. Um, there's more and more research to show that if you sleep before midnight, it is the more restorative sleep. And um, as yet, we, we're only starting to grapple with it, that the brain can, in part, fix itself and correct itself if we give it that restorative sleep. So the tricks to be in bed well before midnight and rise early, uh, which of course we don't do the way we live, but we should be doing it. And it's that good sleep which puts them way ahead of any others in with regards to longevity, lack of cancer, lack of heart disease, stroke, and any other the illnesses that ravage us so badly. Yeah, thank you very much, Abigail. Thank you. That's why I love that you shared that about the sleep because I'd heard that from a friend of mine's grandfather 25 years ago, and I always yes. say that to my husband, and he tells me it's Boba Mize, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna immediately no. have this call. I'm going <laughs> in. So, <laughs> no, that, that friend was correct. Grandpa was right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for everybody else, I'm gonna stop the recording, and if you'd like to stay on and just say hi to the faces that you've come to recognize over the last few weeks. Um, Professor, thank you so much again. We so greatly appreciate it. Um, and also just one last thing is that the survey link that I've sent out, there's an error coming from somewhere. So I will correct that and send it on to our WhatsApp support group. And then also I'll stay on for a few moments if anybody wants to just chat to me about the WhatsApp support group or put their details into um, the, the chat. I'm gonna hand over to Cara to, to close us out. Thank Great. You. Thanks. Thank Thanks you, so, you. so much, Abigail. And um, Professor Potoshnik, once again, our enormous, enormous thanks for always being available um, to help us educate and to support, uh, um, you know, people living with dementia as well as those, those that care for them. Have an absolutely wonderful and awesome birthday. Um, many blessings of good health, happiness and abundance, as I said before. And thank you so much again for so willingly giving time um, to all of us on this webinar. Thank you so, so much, Professor. Thank you, Karen. A very big thank you to Dementia SA and you too for putting in all these efforts. And uh, yeah, it will bode well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Amal. Thanks, Professor. Thank you so much. Bye.